The Rock and Roll and Rebel Show. I'm Derek Shelmerdine. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unraveled show. Now, record producers mould the sound of an artist or band. Some producers, like Phil Spector, well, they are the band. Today we're going to take a look at five legendary British producers. Joe Meek, Glyn Johns, George Martin, Mickey Most, and, interestingly enough, Tony Visconti. But we'll take a, make a start with uh, Joe Meek. Now, he was born in Newent, Gloucestershire on the 5th of April, 1929. And he worked from his London home studio in Holloway Road, Islington. He was famous as being experimental. Uh, lots of reverb and echo. <laughs> Reputedly recorded in the bathroom. Now, the recordings were very much designed to be played in the sort of AM mono world that he he lived in and he was one of the first independent record producers and launched one of britain's first independent record labels triumph but after a handful of releases on triumph he decided to become an independent producer and deliver the recordings through mainstream labels like pi hmv decca top rank and one of his earliest recordings was with gary miller uh, Yellow Rose of Texas. He was the engineer on that, and that was actually Gary Miller's first UK hit, and that was late 1955. And in the spring of 56, he worked with Humphrey Littleton on Bad Penny Blues. Now, interestingly, that was Humphrey Littleton's only UK hit, and he got him to number 19. Joe Meek was the, again the engineer, and George Martin of Beatles fame, uh, he was the head of A&R at Parlophone. Now, that particular song, if you ever hear it, you'll recognise it very much as the backbone for the Beatles' Lady Madonna. And by the summer of 1960, he was working with John Layton. Now, he was a popular actor turned singer. And John Layton released Tell Laura I Love Her. That was on the top rank label. Now, that was a cover of Ray Peterson's original um, song. Ray Peterson didn't have a UK hit with it. Well, neither did um, John Layton. Ray Peterson took it to number seven in America. And it was Ricky Valance who had the UK hit took it to number one for three weeks. John Layton's first hit single came almost exactly a year later with uh, Johnny Remember Me, and that gave him a number one for three weeks. And on the 20th of September 1960, he registered his RGM Sound Limited, and that was the production credit that he used on Joe Meek's singles. That's what you want to be looking out for if you want to check if Joe Meek did the production and in late 1960 he changed the name of a band called the stormers to the outlaws and the outlaws became joe meek's house band and the drummer uh, bobby graham in that original lineup he went on to be a very successful and prolific uh, session drummer now in late 61 bobby graham left the outlaws and went on to join joe brown's brothers uh, and that was the time that Joe Meek formed the Tornadoes as his new house band. And that included uh, Clem Coutini and uh, Heinz Burt. And in early 1962, the Tornadoes became Billy Fury's backing band. Now, they'd sacked uh, the Blue Flames. And Georgie Fame, the keyboard player of the Blue Flames, took over. And they became Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames. And they went on to a lot of commercial success. And it was the summer of 1962 that the Tornadoes had their own colossal success with um, Telstar. It was actually their first UK hit, and it was number one for five weeks in the UK. And it went on to be the first number one on the American charts by a British group. It was number one for, uh, for three weeks. It was actually their only American hit. But this is, think about it, two years before the Beatles took uh, America by storm. So there was not a lot of British activity on the American charts at this time. Now, one of the really interesting bands from uh, Joe Meek's stable was Screaming Lord Such and the Savages. They were very popular, but had very little real commercial success. I mean, their songs included things like Jack the Ripper and Libra and Stollers. 
I'm a Hog for You. And that was a, a Coasters B-side from 1959. And these, these uh, tracks were released by uh, Lord Such around 1963. And also in 63, John Meek felt that it was time that um, bass player Heinz Burt uh, moved on from the Tornadoes because he could see him as a solo star. And he released his uh, first single, Just Like Eddie, and that gave him a, a top five UK hit. And it was the end of 1963 that he got involved in a really interesting project, uh, the movie Rip It Up. Now, it's sometimes referred to as Sing and Swing. Uh, the IMDB website lists Joe Meek's involvement in the film as music and lyrics composed by slash a musical director. And it's a really interesting lineup of people in this movie. You've got Stevie Marriott, who went on to The Small Faces. Mitch Mitchell went on to be Jimi Hendrix's drummer, Heinz Bird. Uh, the Outlaws, his backing band at this time, included Richie Blackmore, who was guitarist, went on to Deep Purple. Mick Underwood, drummer. Now, he's another one of the guys that turned down the opportunity to join Led Zeppelin as they were morphing from the Yardbirds. And Cockney... Uh, Chaz Hodges, bass player and part of the uh, famous Chaz and Dave duo. Now, also in the movie was Gene Vincent, and he released a single at the time, Where Have You Been All My Life, coupled with uh, Temptation Baby. Now, that wasn't a UK hit, but Temptation Baby was written by Joe Meek and was uh, in the movie Live It Up. Sadly, Joe Meek died on the 3rd of February 1967. He actually killed himself on the 8th anniversary of the death of um, Buddy Holly. And he died at his uh, 304 Holloway Road, Islington address that was famously both his home and his recording studio. On that sort of fateful anniversary of uh, Buddy Holly's death, he argued with his landlady, Violet Shenton, shot her dead and then turned the shotgun on himself. The gun was actually owned, interestingly enough, by Tornado's bass player and solo star, Heinz. Now, from 1961, this is a classic example of Joe Meek's work. This was a number one for three weeks, and this is John Layton. Johnny, remember me. Our second producer, Glyn Johns, was born in Epsom, Surrey, on the 15th of February 1942. And he worked with oh, a host of legends, Zeppelin, Eagles, Who, Beatles. He also created the Glyn Johns method of miking up a drum kit. And that used two overhead mics, a snare mic and a kick drum mic. Uh, kick drum being the bass drum and the sound really comes from the overhead mics but then the snare and bass drums can be beefed up with the um, spot mics and it's a very widely used technique but in 1959 he joined IBC Studios as a trainee recording engineer well in late 61 early 62 he decided to turn professional as a singer but that didn't really last very long because his old clients were very keen to have him back um, as an engineer. And in fact, he became one of the very early freelance engineers. He acted as a talent scout in a way. He brought people back to the IBC studio. They were signed up by the studio and then produced by Glyn Johns. And the first two of these people to be recorded at the IBC studios were the Rolling Stones and Georgie Fame. Now, the Rolling Stones famously came into the studio on the 11th of March, 1963. And they wanted to record some demos uh, so that they could attract interest from record labels. At that stage, the Stones were actually a sextet, and pianist Ian Stewart was still performing with them. And they cut five songs that day with uh, Glyn Johns. And then in late 63, early 64, he brought Georgie Fame into IBC to record now, Georgie Fame brought producer Shel Talmy with him. Johns wasn't happy about this, as you can imagine, uh, but agreed to act as um, engineer on the sessions. He didn't get on with Talmy initially, but they, they got to like each other. And in fact, it was through Shel Talmy that uh, Glyn Johns got involved with the, the Who and the Kinks. And Shel Talmy became uh, Glyn Johns' first major client. 
and it was 1967 when he worked with the Small Faces on Ichiku Park. Now that gave them a hit on both sides of the Atlantic and it was the first time he'd used phasing on vocals and drums essentially um, brought distortion, uh, deliberate distortion into the sound. And it was created by using three tape machines, two of them playing the same thing at different frequencies and a third one recording it. And his first concept album came in the May of 68 uh, when Glyn Johns worked with the small faces on their Ogden's Nutgun Flake album. Another legendary recording session, of course, took place on the 27th of September 1968 and that was with Led Zeppelin. They were in the studio to record their first album, and that was the Olympic Studios in London. Now, reputedly, the album cost just £1,782 to make. They self-financed that, and Led Zeppelin's first album was recorded in around about 30 hours or so. Now, when the album was released, the production credits are really quite interesting, and this is how the sleeve describes them. Uh, producer Jimmy Page, director of engineering Glyn Johns, and this is the really interesting one, executive producer Peter Grant. Now, he was their manager. In the uh, December of 1968, on the 11th to be precise, the Rolling Stones recorded a Christmas TV special, or an intended TV special, called Rock and Roll Circus. And Glyn Johns was in there doing the engineering and mixing. Now the acts included John Lennon's Dirty Mac. He was calling himself Winston Leg Thigh. And his Dirty Mac comprised Eric Clapton, Mitch Mitchell, and Keith Richard on bass. And that was John Lennon's first appearance outside the Beatles, and it was actually Brian Jones' his last live performance with the with the Stones. Now, one of the acts on that day was The Who, and they performed a quick one while he's away. An urban myth has it that Mick Jagger didn't sanction the release at the time because he thought they'd been way upstaged by the by The Who. It, it finally got a DVD release in 1996, and on the 2nd of January '69. It was the start of the Get Back project. Now, Paul envisaged this as a project, as a sort of odyssey, where they'd film the recording sessions and they'd film a live concert in a small, intimate theatre and they'd use it to produce um, an album and movie of the, the whole creative process. And the recording was actually led by Glyn Johns. Now, the Beatles were falling apart at this stage and they really couldn't agree on the uh, the tapes and the mixes for Get Back and during the process they actually went and recorded another album they recorded and released Abbey Road so Abbey Road's technically their last album anyway John Lennon gave the Get Back tapes to Phil Spector and on the 23rd of May 1970 entered the UK charts as the Let It Be album which turned out to be their final album and in 71 worked with the the who on who's next and that was the first time that glenn johns had worked with the who since my generation in 1965 by mid 72 he was now working with the with the eagles and on their first album he produced their first album and that spawned their first three american hit singles take it easy witchy woman and the wonderful, peaceful, easy feeling. Now, he also produced their second album, Desperado, one of my all-time favourite albums. And he co-produced their third album, On the Border, with uh, Bill Seismic. Now, the 13th of January 1973 was a red-letter day for Eric Clapton fans. That was when he made his comeback concert at the Rainbow Theatre, and it was recorded by Glenn Johns, but Glenn Johns was, well, very unhappy with the result and refused to mix it. He felt that the album shouldn't even go out. But uh, Clapton was keen for it to go, and they got Bob Pridden to mix it, and it came out as Eric Clapton's Rainbow Concert. And in August 76, he was working with Joan Armour Trading and released the eponymous Joan Armour Trading album. And he actually thinks it's one of the best albums he ever made. I mean, the tracks include Love and Affection, 
and that was the first hit single, got to a number 10. Since then, he's worked for the likes of um, Nine Below Zero, The Clash, Jimmy Page, Crosby, Stills and Nash, absolute host of others. But from one of Glyn John's favourite albums, and with one of the most haunting sax breaks you'll ever hear, this is Joan Armour Trading, Love and Affection. You're listening to Derek Shelmerdine with the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show. We're looking at five legendary British record producers. But before continuing with the story, there's an opportunity to win a signed copy of my book, Rock and Roll Unraveled. Every month I run a quiz in conjunction with the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show. And for the current quiz, check out the homepage on my website, rockandrollunraveled.com. Follow the link to the quiz at the top of the page, send me the answer, and I'll send you a signed copy of Rock and Roll Unraveled. And that goes to the lucky winner anywhere in the world. And Rock and Roll Unraveled tells the story of rock and roll from its roots to mid-1970s punk, and Record Collective Magazine's review described the book as comprehensive and invaluable. Well, good luck with the competition, but meanwhile, back to the producers. And our third legend... Is George Martin. Born on the 3rd of January 1926 in Holloway, London. He's most famous for the Beatles, of course. He signed them to EMI's Parlophone label after they'd been turned down by Decca. He joined EMI and the Parlophone label in September 1950, but he was mostly focused on jazz, novelty, comedy records. He had an early hit in 1952 with Peter Ustinov's Mock Mozart and in around 55 that he became the head of the Parlophone label and in the late 50s he worked with the quintessentially British duo Flanders and Swan and the genius that is Peter Sellers uh, the early 60s brought more comedy uh, the birth of satire arrived with uh, Beyond the Fringe, Alan Bennett, Jonathan Miller, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore Charlie Drake, the comedian, a great little song called My Boomerang Won't Come Back. He did venture out into the world of um, pop music now and again, and at the uh, last round of 1961, he produced uh, Paul Raven and version of Tower of Strength. Now, Paul Raven became Gary Glitter, and Tower of Strength was a cover of the UK hit from Frankie Vaughan, which in turn was a cover of the Gene McDaniels original. But in the summer of 1962, really the most well-known artist-producer relationship in history began. And that began on the 6th of June 1962, when the Beatles made their first visit to Abbey Road. And this was with drummer Pete Best, and it was shortly after they returned from their third Hamburg trip. And this is where they recorded the first version of Love Me Do. And George Martin liked them, but signed them up to Parlophone on the proviso that they replaced Pete Best. So on the 4th of September, they were back in Abbey Road for their second visit, and this time Ringo Starr was on the drum stool. They recorded two songs, Love Me Do and How Do You Do It. A producer, George Martin, was very keen for the Beatles to release the Mitch Murray penned How Do You Do It as their first single. But the Liverpudlians were adamant. They only wanted to release their own material, Love Me Do, as their debut single. Now George Martin again had not been that impressed with Ringo as the drummer and when they came back for the third attempt at Love Me Do on the 11th of of September George Martin had brought in session drummer Andy White and that's when they recorded the third version of Love Me Do which has Andy White on drums and Ringo on tambourine. That's how to work out which version you're listening to if there's a tambourine Andy White's on drums And that was released on the 5th of October 1962 as their first UK single. And the rest, as they say, is history. George Martin now worked with a number of beat groups and very successful he was too. And one of the most successful of these was Jerry and the Pacemakers. And on the 14th of March 1963, their first single, How Do You Do It?, entered the charts at number one. And that's uh, remarkable for a number of reasons. One, it was the first number one for a beat group. And Jerry and the Pacemakers actually beat the Beatles to the top spot. The Fab Four didn't actually make the number one UK slot until their third single from Me To You in the April 
How Do You Do It also gave Jerry and the Pacemakers the accolade of being the first group, the first act in the UK to have their first three singles enter the charts at number one. Their second success was I Like It, that went straight to the number one in the May, and in the October, You'll Never Walk Alone gave them a hat trick. Now in 65, George Martin left DMI and set up Associated Independent Recording, known as Air. And the rest of the 60s, the Beatles became known as the most famous group in the world ever. And George Martin's influence on the band's success is absolutely immeasurable. There's no doubt in my mind that if there is a fifth Beatle, it's George Martin. Across the 70s, he continued to work with some great people. John McLaughlin's Mahavishnu Orchestra, he worked on Apocalypse, Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow album. And in 1979, he opened a recording studio in Montserrat he called Air Studios. Sadly, that was destroyed by a hurricane in 1989. And in the 80s, he continued to work with lots of interesting people. Cheap Trick, he was... Uh, producer for their All Shuck Up album, although that did receive uh, mixed reviews, where it was uh, sometimes suggested there was a bit of a mismatch between George Martin and the, the band. He worked on UFOs, No Place to Run, that was the first post-Michael Schenker UFO album, and Ultravox's Quartet. But to go back to Jerry and the Pacemakers and You'll Never Walk Alone, that started life uh, as a song written by Rodgers and Hammerstein, and originally performed in their 1945 musical Carousel. It became the anthem of Liverpool Football Club and the third consecutive single to enter at number one. It was there for four weeks. And this is Jerry and the Pacemakers with You'll Never Walk Alone. You're listening to the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show and we're taking a look at some legendary British producers. But just before we continue, there's an awful lot of the bands and artists we talk about in the show are on tour now. To check out the latest for everybody I've mentioned on the show, check out my website. That's rockandrollunraveled.com, and that's unraveled with two L's. At the top of the homepage, you'll see a section called 1960s and 70s Artists Touring Now. Just click on that and check out for the people in the show and well over 100 other artists who are on the road. Well, our next producer is Mickey Most. Now, he was born on the 20th of June 1938. He was born Michael Peter Hayes in Aldershot, Hampshire. And Mickey Most's trademark was very much his ability to pick hit records. He was a hit maker, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, around about 1958, he formed the Most Brothers with Alex Murray. And their backing band at some point included Future Shadows, Jet Harris, Bruce Welsh and Hank Marvin. They actually had a single in the July of 58. Don't go home. It didn't trouble the charts in any way. At the end of 58, he went to uh, South Africa with his girlfriend. Now, very few American records had been released there at that time. So he was way ahead of the game and he formed a group and had 11 number ones. He was there about four years, and that's when he got into production and engineering because he was doing the work on his own records, and he found he enjoyed production more than performing. He returned to the UK around 1963. He wanted to move in production, but uh, continued to perform and toured with the likes of the Everly Brothers and the Rolling Stones. Well, on the 25th of July 1963, he had his only personal chart success when Mr Porter entered the UK charts. It was number 45 for one week, but it was a hit record. Interestingly enough, Jimmy Page was uh, on the record as a session guitarist. He met the animals around this time and brought them to London to record Baby Let Me Take You Home. And it was the spring of 64 that his career in production really started to um, make some good steps forward. Now, the animals' first UK hit, Baby Let Me Take You Home, got them to number 21. It was followed in the summer by the legendary House of the Rising Sun, and that was a hit on both sides of the Atlantic. It was number one for a week in the UK. And in America, it was the first British Invasion single to make number one that wasn't associated with the Beatles. And in mid-'64, he was working with the Nashville teens, 
and they had a hit with uh, Tobacco Road, the John D. Loudermilk song. Now he found sustained success uh, around the same time, the summer of 64, with Herman's Hermits. Their first single, I'm Into Something Good, and spent two weeks at number one. And when he was introduced to Herman's Hermits, he was really attracted by Peter Noon, the lead singer. He thought he had a nice personality and looked like a young John F. Kennedy. And he thought he'd go down very well in America. And my goodness, he was right about that. Well, the end with the animals came at the in the October of 65 with It's My Life. That was the last animal single produced by Mickey Most. After seven consecutive hit singles, the animals and Mickey Most parted company. But then he resurrected Donovan's career. The end of 1966, his first single with Donovan, Sunshine Superman, uh, became a hit. Gave him a, a number two. And in the spring of 67, he was working with Jeff Beck, gave him his first hit, Hi-Ho, Silver Lining. And then he worked on a few of uh, Jeff Beck's albums, things like Truth and uh, Beckola. Though it, everything he touched didn't necessarily turn to gold. In sort of early, mid-67, he worked with the Yardbirds on their little games, single and album. The single didn't um, trouble the, the charts at all. But it's not really surprising because the Yardbirds were coming to the end of their life and they were in the process of morphing into Led Zeppelin. And it was 69 when Mickey Most founded uh, Rack Records, and his first two artists on Rack were Julie Felix and Peter Noon. And at the end of 69, Donovan had his last hit, not just his last hit with Mickey Most, but his last UK hit until 1990. And that was um, a joint effort with Donovan and the Jeff Beck group. And they released the wonderfully titled Goo Goo Barajabble. At the turn of the decade, it was also the end of the line for Herman's Hermits, uh, now on Mickey Most rack label. Their last single came in November 1970, and that was Lady Barbara, and that was credited to uh, Peter Noon and Herman's Hermits. He went on to work with um, people like Alexis Corner's CCS, wonderful abbreviation for the full name Collective Consciousness Society. He worked with Hot Chocolate, Susie Quattro, and uh, a host of others, a really successful hip, hit maker. Well, one single that's absolutely guaranteed to split opinion, but it's a real foot tapper, it's a guaranteed to get them on the dance floor kind of song. That's Jeff Bett's first hit, and this is Hi Ho Silver Lining. Well, our final producer today is Tony Visconti. He was born in Brooklyn, New York on the 24th of April 1944. Well, born in New York, how on earth can he be a British producer, I hear you say? Well, he made his name with uh, Mark Boland, David Bowie in particular, and a lot of other UK legends. So for the purpose of today, Tony Visconti is an honorary Brit. We started life out in 1957 with his first group, Mike D and the Dukes, and around 1963, he'd become Tony and Siegfried, a husband and wife singing duo, a bit like the Mamas and Papas. But it was around 1967 he became involved in production when he met Denny Cordell. Cordell was looking for an American producer to move to London, and Visconti worked with Cordell on a Georgie Fame song, Because I Love You. Visconti suggested some arrangements, and the song was a big hit. Shortly after the Georgie Fame single, Tony Visconti flew to the UK to work with uh, Danny Cordell. And when he got there, he worked with the likes of uh, Procol Harum. He mixed Joe Cocker's iconic A Little Help From My Friends. And in the late summer of 67, Tony Visconti met Mark Bolan. He was at the UFO club and Tyrannosaurus Rex were playing there. He introduced Bolan to Denny Cordell and Cordell signed him up. Around the May of 68, he had a minor hit with Tyrannosaurus Rex, his uh, Deborah. And then Tony Visconti produced all of uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex singles afterwards. And it was around this sort of time that he met David Bowie. And in the November of 69, David Bowie released his second album, eponymously titled. And Tony Visconti produced all the tracks except Space Oddity. That particular one was produced by Gus Dungeon. And Rick Waitman played session keyboards on the, on the album. Now, by the middle of July, he was working with the Strobes on their second album, Dragonfly. And Rick Waitman was on that particular album 
Now, the album was recorded in Denmark, and the band's manager was Danish and had a deal going there. And Visconti reckons that this album really sharpened his skills because he was working with a, a, a new desk um, at the time, and it had some really clever capabilities. Anyway, Tony Visconti produced the next couple of Straub's albums, and uh, after that they handled their own production. And again, in his early 70s, he was working with Badfinger, when they were still called the Ivies, and Manfred Mann. By the end of 1970, Tyrannosaurus Rex had become T-Rex, and their Rider White Swan entered the UK charts. After three minor hits with Tyrannosaurus Rex, Rider White Swan was a number two, and Mark Boland was finally a star. And it was around this time that Tony Visconti became an independent producer. And in the spring of 1971, he was working with Bowie on his third album, The Man Who Sold the the World. This is where Tony Visconti and David Bowie fell out. The record company didn't really like the album, and they lost interest in Bowie. And David Bowie thought the answer was to change his manager and move to Tony De Vries. And Visconti wasn't happy about this, and basically said that if he went with De Vries, he was off. (laughs) But we did move in with uh, De Vries, and that was the end of that relationship for a little while. By 73, he'd formed his own record label, Good Earth, and that was with people like Carmen, Judy Sug, Surprise Sisters. And an interesting one, uh, in late 1973, he worked on the Paul McCartney Band on the Run album. He did the orchestrations, conducted the orchestra, but he was not a happy bunny when the album came out because the credits on the sleeve simply bundled Tony Visconti into the special thanks credits on the album sleeve. And in early 74, it came to an end with um, some Mark Bolan. They were working on the album Zinc Alloy and the Hidden Riders of Tomorrow. And at this, by this time, Tony Visconti was thinking that Bolan was really just regurgitating old material and he really wasn't very happy. But Bolan was happy. The stuff was selling well. And he was still very much in the limelight. And before they went into the studio, Bolan made a demo with Visconti. They called uh, Children of Ran. And it was a lot more complicated than he was doing. And Bolan suggested that he was going to turn this into a rock opera, another Tommy But that was the idea, but when they went in the studio to record Zinc Alloy, Boland just went back to knocking out the old three-minute repetitions. So that was the end of that particular relationship. And it was late 73 when Tony Visconti formed his own production company. And the first job was to mix uh, Diamond Dogs for David Bowie. And this is what brought Bowie and Visconti back together again. And then... Late 74, the first album they did together was David Bowie Live. And Visconti worked regularly then with uh, Bowie after that. Now Visconti was also working with people like Sparks, Thin Lizzy and The Stranglers. Well, the relationship with David Bowie very much continued uh, for the rest of Bowie's life and they co-produced David Bowie's last album, Black Star, together. Well, that's it. I've been Derek Shelmadon. You've been listening to the Rock and Roll Unravel Show and the Whistle Stop Look at Five Legendary British Producers. I hope you've enjoyed this show as much as I've been putting the whole thing together. If you're into social media, you can find me on Twitter at RNR Unraveled, Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled, and remember you can win a copy of my book, Rock and Roll Unraveled. Uh, go to the website homepage rockandrollunraveled.com click on the link to competition and i'll post the book to the lucky winner anywhere in the world good luck with the competition join me next time for another look at a little piece of rock and roll unraveled now to play us out from one of the albums tony visconti and david bowie worked on together it was a hit single in 1977 and this is david bowie and heroes <laughs>